Greetings. Welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, and things adjacent. And I'm going to bring you a very quick video tonight, or trying, another attempt at a quick video. Uh, just going to go through some headlines. Um, I may or may not get stuck reading more of an article than I wanted to. I don't know. But I actually have two interviews that I'm doing tomorrow. Um, which you guys will be privy to very soon. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be interviewing Guy McPherson tomorrow and also William Falk, who was the lawyer um, who was talking about, uh, if you all remember the video I showed a few weeks ago, or the video that I linked and talked about a few weeks ago, he was talking about um, the right to defend nature um, against uh, the doers of evil, the evil doers. Um, so we're, we'll be talking to him as well, and that should be very, very interesting. Um, but I haven't done a video in a couple days, so I wanted to bring this to you. Uh, this is from Des Demona Despair. This is kind of <clears throat> a few weeks old, not old. It's, in, it's from May, uh, May 6th, 2019. North Atlantic Ocean phytoplankton decline coincides with warming temperatures over the last 150 years. 10% of the marine food base in this region has been lost over the industrial era. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the headline says mostly, mostly all it needs to say. Virtually all marine life depends on the productivity of phytoplankton microscopic organisms that work tirelessly at the ocean surface to absorb the carbon dioxide that gets dissolved into the upper ocean from the atmosphere through photosynthesis uh, th synthesis I am sure these microbes break down carbon dioxide into oxygen some of which ultimately gets released back to the atmosphere and organic carbon which they store until they themselves are consumed this plankton derived carbon fuels the rest of the marine food web from the tiniest shrimp to the giant sea turtles, and humpback whales. Now scientists at MIT Woods Hole Ocean Oceanographic Institute, um, or WHOOI, and elsewhere have found evidence that phytoplankton's productivity is declining steadily. In the North Atlantic, one of the world's most productive marine basins, in a paper appearing today in Nature, the researchers report that phytoplankton's productivity in this important region has gone down around 10% since the mid-19th century and the start of the Industrial Era. This decline coincides with steadily rising surface temperatures over the same period of time. Uh, I'm going to link that below. Moving on. <clears throat> Howler monkeys are victims of Veracruz drought and 40 C temperatures. Nearly 10 have died in the last two months in uh, Chancaral, Minat Minatitlan, an extended severe drought in southern Veracruz has proved fatal for rare howler monkeys. A combination of extreme temperatures nearing 40 C and a three-month dearth of rainfall in the region has deprived the monkeys of access to sufficient water. Alfredo Martinez Alfonso, a municipal police officer in Chancaral, uh, Minititlan, the location of a large wildlife re refuge, said nearly 10 monkeys have died. Uh, most are mothers who then leave their young behind as orphans. Everything has dried up, so the animals have been dying. Throughout the months of April and May, they do not have water, and so they do not have any way to get nutrients. The death of the monkeys is something we have never seen before. I have lived here for 25 years, and in all that time, we have never, not ever heard of any deaths from a drought until now. <clears throat> I'm going to link this below. And this is an article that I'm... I was afraid I, I might get stuck on uh, the selfish case for saving bees. It's how to save ourselves. And this is from Allison Benjamin from May 18th, 2019. These crucial pollinators keep our world alive. Yes, they're under threat, but all is not lost, says Allison. I want to see. Uh, I'm going to see if I can just kind of swoop through this. Um, 
A few years ago, well, let me see, when I see a, bu- a bee buzzing around my garden or in the park in early spring, I get a real thrill from being able to, to identify her if she is black and darting among small white tubular, tubular flowers with her long tongue protruding and her legs tucked under her furry round body. I know she is a hairy-footed flower bee. Hairy-footed flower bee. A few years ago, I wouldn't have noticed her because, like most people, I thought all bees were striped. I also assumed they made honey, stung, and lived in a hive with queen bee or workers, but only... Only honeybees fit this description, and they account for just a handful or so of the astonishing 25,000 bee species worldwide. worldwide. Bumblebees, the plump, stripy garden visitors that have been voted the UK's favorite insect make up about 1%. Uh, This month, a landmark UN Global Assessment Report warned that a million wildlife species were facing extinction at an, an unprecedented rate. Thousands of bee species will be among them. In Europe, 37% of them have experienced a recent decline in population. 9% face extinction. Almost a quarter of those in North America are at increasing risk of becoming extinct. In other parts of the world where data is limited, they all face similar threats from intensive farming, climate breakdown, and invasive species, and their demise is potentially catastrophic for nature and humankind. A bee visiting a flower is an act of nature that has been playing out for more than 100 million years. Um, Flowering plants evolved with bees, developing rich perfumes, colorful petals, and nectar to entice them to visit. Uh, The poet Khalil Gibran beautifully described the symbiotic relationship to a bee. A flower is the fountain of life, and to the flower, the bee is a messenger of love. It makes bees a linchpin in nature and modern agriculture. Uh, so that goes through insecticides, uh, pesticides, being linked to deep bee deaths. Um, so they're subsidizing farms to produce crops using conventional practices that allow nature to do the work. Oh, it's not, uh, so this is not that long of an article. I am still not going to read the whole thing. Without food and habitat to sustain wild pollinators, modern farming has become reliant on truck, trucking in managed honeybee hives when crops are in bloom and flying in factory bred bumblebees to pollinate tomatoes and other crops grown in greenhouses. This can spread lethal parasites and disease to wild bees, including the giant golden bumblebee of Patagonia, which is now threatened with extinction. Uh, I did not know that. So I I just read an article about the trucking of bees all over the U.S. Um, So apparently that is not good for the wild bees. Who would have thunk? So this is kind of like a feel-good article about we need to save the bees. We need to save the bees. Um, Another headline, the military, not the White House, is readying or rhetoric for climate change. The Pentagon seems at odds with the president over how best to prepare for climate-related extreme weather. This is from April 16th. In the middle of March, Marine... uh, uh, Commandant General Robert Neller, the U- uh, U.S. Marine Corps top officer, issued a grim warning to the Pentagon on the state of his fighting force in a pair of memos addressed to Navy Secretary Richard Spencer and Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan. Neller outlined a series of unexpected demands that he said pose an unacceptable risk to Marine Corps combat readiness and solvency. Chief among them was President Donald Trump's state of emergency declaration regarding troop deployments and wall construction at the U.S.-Mexico border. Those unplanned burdens, according to Neller, required an unwelcome shift in resources, forcing the Marines to significantly scale back and in some cases cancel outright critical training and exercises. That loss will degrade the combat readiness and effectiveness of the Corps, Neller wrote. But it wasn't just training that was affected in an expanded list of negative factors Neller also warned about the scarcity of Pentagon-allocated funding for rebuilding efforts after Hurricane Florence and Michael, essentially arguing that unpredictable, unpredictable weather events and natural disasters pose as grave a danger to military readiness as the president's erratic border deployments. 
Hurricanes Florence and Michael, the two most destructive storms of 2018, together accounted for 100 deaths, tens of billions of dollars in damages throughout the Carolinas and the Florida panhandle. The storms also proved costly to Marine Corps facilities in the region. The inability to reprogram money and the lack of supplemental Supplemental for Hurricane Florence damage is negatively impacting Marine Corps readiness. Neller wrote, we are not receiving the fiscal support necessary to address the critical situation in North Carolina. We are not far away from hurricane season and we're still recovering from the damage from yesterday. Uh, days after Neller's memo... Memos leaked in March, Shanahan told officials from the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force that he planned on reallocating $600 million in defense funding for near-term recovery efforts, that is, rebuilding, and natural disaster preparedness. Of that sum, $400 million would go toward repairing storm damage at uh, Fort Lejeune, a down payment on the future military constructing funding, construction funding, according to military.com. See, so they're actually using money to rebuild and to um, clean up damage from climate-related disasters. Why not start taking some of this money? I mean, it's obviously never going to happen in a Trump presidency, but why not start taking some of this money and actually just, you know, use it for, you know, the billions and billions of dollars that we have using it for climate mitigation. Uh, in the next month, the Pentagon will provide a list of military construction projects available for postponement in order for the Defense Department to pony up $3.6 billion to pay for the border wall under Trump's February 15th National Emergency Declaration, according to a Pentagon memo obtained by Task and Purpose as down from $6.8 billion in unawarded projects that the Pentagon officially offered up for potential cancellation in March. But it still represents a major retasking of military resources, which raises the question, is Trump bankrolling his version of border security at the expense of the military's own safety? Bum, bum, bum. Probably. That's all I'm going to read of this article. I'm going to link it below. You guys can read the rest of that if you are so inclined. Another headline, Amazon Tribe wins lawsuit against big oil, saving millions of acres of rainforest. And we can applaud that at Black Bear News. Yes, we can. The Amazon rainforest is well known across the world for being the largest and most dense area of woodland in the world, spanning across nine countries. The Amazon is home to millions of different animal and plant species, as well as harboring some of the world's last remaining indigenous groups, the Warwani Warani people of Pastaza are an indigenous tribe from the Ecuadorian Amazon, Ecuadorian Amazon, and have lived in the rainforest for many generations. However, their home came under threat from a large oil company. Guess who? Knock, knock, knock. It's an oil company. <clears throat> what do you want? We want to destroy your home. Oh, no. They didn't take it lightly. After a long legal battle with a number of organizations, the uh, Warani people successfully protected half a million acres of their ancestral territory in the Amazon rainforest from being mined for oil drilling by huge oil co corporations. The auctioning off of Warani lands to the oil companies was suspended indefinitely by a three-judge panel of the Pastaza Pro Provincial Court. The panel simply trashed the cons uh, consultation process. The Ecuadorian government had undertaken with the tribe in 2012, which rendered the attempt at land purchase null and void. This win for indigenous for the indigenous tribe has now set an invaluable legal precedent for other indigenous nations across the Ecuadorian Amazon. After accepting a Warani Warani bid, cannot say that right now, for court protection to stop an oil bidding process, <clears throat> the court also halted the potential auctioning off of 16 oil blocks that cover over 7, 7 million acres of indigenous territory. <clears throat> That's awesome. That's beautiful. Let's see if it keeps um, staying true. How long will this injunction last? Or this nullification last? Who knows? Washington is the first state to allow composting of human bodies. If you're into composting human bodies, Washington's the state for you. 
Um, you all know the reason behind this. And um, so this is some kind of good step. I'm going to link this below. You guys can read up on that. And I think, well, let's see. Let me just give you uh, two or three paragraphs. <clears throat> Supporters say the method is an environmentally friendly alternative to cremation, which releases carbon dioxide and particulates into the air and conventional burial, which people are drained, in which people are drained of their blood, pumped full of formaldehyde and other chemicals that can pollute groundwater, placed in a nearly indestructible coffin, taking up land. Yes, there is absolutely no reason to do that. It's a serious weight on the earth and the environment as your final farewell, said Senator Jamie Pedersen, Seattle Democrat who sponsored the measure. <clears throat> he said the legislation was inspired by his na neighbor, Katrina Spade, who was an architecture graduate student of the University of Mass Massachusetts Amherst. When she began researching the funeral industry, she came up with the idea for human composting. She came up with it? Modeling it on a practice farmers have long used to dispose of livestock. Um... She tweaked the process and found that wood, chip, wood chips, alfalfa, and straw created a mixture of nitrogen and carbon that accelerates natural decomposition when a body is placed in a temperature and moisture-controlled vessel and rotated. Ooh. <laughs> that's weird. I'm sorry. That's a little weird. Um, a pilot project at a Washington State University tested the idea last year on six bodies, all donors who Spade said wanted to be part of the study. Um, okay. Okay. That's all I'm going to read of that. Uh, again, if you're into human composting, you might want to read this article. Um, I'm going to, I'm just guessing it's a better thing for the earth overall, and we'll just go with that. I don't know about bodies being turned in vessels with wood chips. I don't know. That's just weird to me, but that's just me. Um, but that's fine if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace.